All right, so we are up to chapter 12 now in Thomas Pynchon's novel V. And chapter 12 is a very short uh, chapter uh, that returns back to the whole sick crew and to the adventures of Profane and company. Um, Oswald Spengler in The Decline of the West uh, writes about this idea where he says that one of the main characteristics of late stage megalopolitan uh, civilizations, when you have these large uh, urban populations living in confined quarters, swarming, you get population swarms in giant world cities like Babylon uh, <clears throat> and late stages in Egypt and Mesopotamia and so forth, and in Rome in particular, is what Spangler calls what happens is a metaphysical turning towards death in which the populations slowly begin to exterminate themselves through suicide on the one hand and through abortions on the other, both of which spread like plagues in these uh, late stage uh, cosmopolitan world cities. And eventually what ends up happening is a slow process of depopulation. So if you look at Rome, uh, the, the later days of Rome, it slowly becomes depopulated. By the time the German barbarians get there, there's not much of a population left there really for them to conquer. Um, cattle were grazing in the Forum and in the uh, Colosseum. Uh, there are accounts of that. And so too here in this chapter, uh, chapter 12, uh, this is the chapter um, it's called In Which Things Are Not So Amusing, but it could have been subtitled In Which the Whole Sick Crew Gets Even Sicker because this is uh, Pynchon's chapter on the beginnings of the decline of the whole sick crew into abortion and suicide, um, despite the fact that he still tells it in comic fashion. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the crew is beginning to disintegrate. Things are falling apart and we're heading for the novel's denouement, which will take place on the island of Malta. And so what we have here is a series of uh, misadventures, especially with the women, uh, the characters of uh, Fina, whom we already saw earlier, uh, was gang raped uh, by the Playboys, the street gang, the Playboys. Paola, Paola Maestral, uh, has gone into prostitution, uh, and Esther Harvitz uh, has now, as the chapter opens up, Esther Harvitz has gotten pregnant by Schoenmaker, the plastic surgeon, who refuses to pay for her to have an abortion. And so two characters try to save her, Slab, uh, the guy who paints all the cheese danishes and with whom she'd had a brief a fling, and Rachel. Rachel looks after Esther kind of as a mother. She's been uh, looking after both Paula and Esther as a mother all along here. And um, <clears throat> so what happens is that, um, um, let's see, before we get to that, the chapter actually opens with McClintock Sphere and uh, Rooney Winsome, the record executive who works for Outlandish Records, are going to uh, try and rescue Paula from her prostitution, where she's taken the name Ruby, um, in uh, Upper Manhattan, One uh, Twelfth Street, wherever that is, ish, and um, they pick her up. And uh, Winsome has a crush on her, but he knows that he can't have her. And Winsome's starting to get a little bit loony. He sings a funny song to Rachel over the phone, who hangs up on him halfway. And then we find out that Esther has gotten pregnant. Um, Rachel's been looking for her, wondering what's up with her. She's moody. She's not talking to Rachel. Uh, that, but then she tells Slab that she is indeed pregnant. So Slab's solution is to throw a party uh, with the whole sick crew and to take donations to raise money for her. He's looking for $300, uh, which in 1950s currency, I don't know what that would be. Um, he's looking for money to uh, raise to pay for her to go to Cuba uh, to get an abortion and then fly back. And she'll be uh, a larger sort of human yo-yo, he says, in that process. She's willing to do this. She's willing to get rid of the child. Uh, but Rachel now doesn't want her to do it. And so Rachel spends much of the chapter tr trying to track her down uh, and find her so that she doesn't make what Rachel feels surprisingly for Rachel, who has a strong relationship with the inanimates, um, to, uh, to save her. And in a way, I suppose an abortion can re be regarded once again as the intrusion of the inanimates into the female body, into the physical human soma, uh, and disrupting the natural cycles that are taking place therein. It's yet another a version of uh, invasion by the inanimate. And then so Slab throws the party, raises the money from the whole sick crew. He comes up with $295. He throws a 10 in on top of that. And then so she's all set to go. Now, meanwhile, uh, Rennie Winsome is having problems with his wife, Mafia, uh, the woman who's based loosely on Ayn Rand. And... Um, He's having problems with her that has thrown him into a suicidal depression. And so there's a, a rather comic scene uh, where he's trying to commit suicide uh, at this party. He's standing in front of a window and uh, it's seven stories up. 
So he conceives the idea at the party where he's standing there. He, he has this monologue with himself about what's wrong with the whole sick crew, and there's something wrong with all of them. Um, Fergus Mixolydian, <clears throat> the Irish Armenian Jew, takes money from a foundation named after a man who spent millions trying to prove 13 rabbis rule the world. Fergus sees nothing wrong there. This is his monologue standing in front of the window that Pig Bodine takes notice of. Esther Harvitz pays to get the body she was born with altered and then falls deeply in love with the man who mutilated her. Esther sees nothing wrong either. Raoul, the television writer, can produce drama devious enough to slip by any sponsor's roadblock and still tell the staring fans what's wrong with them and what they're watching. Uh, but he's happy with westerns and, detec and detective stories. Slab the painter, whose eyes are open, has technical skill, and if you will, soul, uh, but is committed to cheese danishes. Melvin the folk singer has no talent. Ironically, he does more social commenting than the rest of the crew put together. He accomplishes nothing. Mafia Winsome is smart enough to create a world, but too stupid not to live in it. Finding the real world, never jiving with her fancy, she spends all kinds of energy, sexual, emotional, trying to make it conform, never succeeding. And then he says, and on it goes. Anybody who continues to live in a subculture so demonstrably sick has no right to call himself well. The only well thing to do is what I am going to do now, namely, jump out this window. So he sets his beer down, and then he proceeds to jump out the window without realizing, he throws himself out the window and <clears throat> without realizing that there's a fire escape down below. So he lands three feet below on the fire escape. Then he climbs back up to the window, but the, by this time, uh, Peg Bodine notices what he's doing and comes over, and just as he jumps, grabs him by the belt buckle, uh, so he's holding him, jackknifed, uh, I, I suppose he's prone uh, facing the street below where a drunk has taken notice of what's going on up above and the drunk is gathering people around uh, to watch the suicide that's going on so a crowd is gathering below and pig is trying to uh, talk uh, winsome out of jumping finally pulls him back in through the window but then winsome runs down around to and out the staircase down to the next floor where pig then intercepts him and so on as they go down the floors with winsome attempting to jump out the window each time uh, and not pig rescuing him, pig being in the very unlikely role of, of the savior of Winsome here, um, <clears throat> trying to rescue him. And then finally they get down to uh, just above the first floor. They're, they're one floor up. And uh, by this time, of course, the cops have arrived and they have a net there. And so Winsome throws himself down one story <laughs> onto the net and just bounces off. Um, so notice that the, there's a number of characters here trying to save each other. There's, there's a number of rescues trying to go on here. Pig Bodine uh, saves, uh, more or less successfully, Rooney Winsome. Uh, Slab and Rachel are trying to save Esther, one from uh, com committing the abortion, the other from not doing the abortion. Uh, McClintock Sphere is trying to save uh, Paola from prostitution. And she, they're going to return her back to Malta in the next chapter, where she will be accompanied by Stencil and Profane. <clears throat> Stencil and Profane will meet in the next chapter now for the first time. Uh, the two comic uh, antagonists of the novel that, that we'll meet um, to go back with Paola back to Malta. Stencil wants to go back there for obvious reasons, and uh, he wants uh, Profane to go along just to keep Paola under control. I don't think he knows how to manage her. Um, and then so, okay, so then they go to the airport, and the scene ends up at Idlewild Airport with Rachel pursuing Esther, uh, and Profane is there trying to help her catch before she leaves on the, on the flight, and they're too late. They, they miss it. Um, and there, Profane dumps, uh, rump, uh, rather b bumps into uh, Fina, the girl that he had been, that he'd had a crush on, who had wanted him to deflower her, and who had been gangbanged by the Playboys. Uh, he runs into her, and she says, "Well, I'm on my way back to San Juan. I'm, there, I'm going back there." Um, and he's trying to convince her, "What's where's Angel and Geronimo?" He's trying to convince her to stay. Um, so everyone is is in need of rescue here, and. Um, and then the chapter then ends with uh, <clears throat> McClintock driving uh, Paula. And then he comes to a realization regarding his antinomy that he set up. Recall in, previous, in a previous chapter where he'd set up this flip-flop, hot-cool antinomy uh, where the culture either tends to be, uh, like during the World War, World War II, uh, in a hot mode with love and aggression as these extremes, whereas the cool mode is that of indifference. Um, but the problem with the indifferent cool mode is that it doesn't seem to be involved at all. And I had contrasted this earlier with McLuhan's distinction between media hot and cool. And here, um, as, he's, as McClintock is driving Paolo, he comes to the realization that 
But what it should really be is to keep cool, but care. Um, that's the way he resolves his flip flop dichotomy is to keep cool. Don't lose your nerve, but at the same time, make sure you are involved. Uh, as a number of these individuals in the whole sick crew are, do care about each other and are trained to help each other. Uh, but there is a general attitude of indifference. Profane most certainly is indifferent. Um, he doesn't much care what goes on around him. Uh, so he's guilty of not keeping cool, maybe, but not caring at all um, what happens or what happens to whoever, because he feels like a helpless, passive schlemiel. He is himself in need of rescue and constantly, Rachel is constantly trying to rescue him, uh, trying to get him a, a job. He's just lost his job at the, um, <clears throat> at the agency that he had been hired out as night watchman. So he's lost uh, yet another job or is about to actually in, in chapter 13. So this is a short chapter and that's the upshot of it. So we'll leave it there uh, and then resume with uh, chapter 13.